Armor is one of the most iconic elements of fantasy. So why is it practically pointless? Hello everyone, Lars here with another Writer's Rant, brought to you by Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And yeah, let's have a chat about armor. Have you ever searched YouTube and watched clips from epic war films like Kingdom of Heaven or Braveheart? Or even bad action films like the recent Robin Hood renditions, like what is up with that machine gun crossbow for crying out loud? Or maybe even fantasy films like Lord of the Rings. And then you scroll through the comments and you find all those complaints about the worthless armor they are wearing, or how it isn't even well represented, it's misused, it's impractical, or just plain pointless because a sword can impale a heavy breastplate armor? No? Just me? Okay, fair enough, but it is a problem in our writing, and I will admit that this was a mistake that I made for the first few years of myself writing epic fantasy. Making armor nothing more than just some sort of cool thing that someone wears, but that is ultimately pointless. And I have to ask myself, why did I back then, and why do so many writers still do that? Why do we make armor pointless? Because armor takes a long time to craft, and it is intelligently made to repel multiple weapons and cushion the blows that come. It has to be practical, and in real history, the right kind of armor could help keep casualties and injuries to a minimum. This is why some of the battles that are like super crazy, both in antiquity and in medieval times, could result in very few recorded casualties, because the armor was just that good. But you know what's also cool, just like well-made armor? Watching someone tear their way through heavily armored knights with ease. And that's because we deep down know that good armor is supposed to just repel any sort of attack. And so when we see the hero cleave their way through all these men like butter, I'm like, Moses through the Red Sea. It is amazing. So yeah, it's awesome, and I will personally always love those kinds of scenes and moments where someone is just hacking through all of these people, because it's cool. It really is, but it's created a problem. The problem being that because we as the audience and the writers know the protective value of the armor, when said armor is rendered ineffectual time and again, it takes us out of the suspension of disbelief. It also makes it harder to fear for the main character because we know that they're just going to wreck the enemy instead of having to search out the weak points within the armor and not get hacked to ribbons in the process. Yes, we can use armor to much greater effect in our writing. In well-known books, like the books in the Song of Ice and Fire series, we see that armor is often used as a way of identifying the noble house or proclaiming the identity of an individual knight. While a helmet with antlers would be extremely cumbersome, it gets the message across. And fantasy writers don't have to strictly adhere always to the rules of practicality. Armor is simply a wonderful way to communicate allegiance and character through imagery. However, I have found that this is where fantasy portrayals of armor usually end, at least in any sort of meaningful way. Instead of using armor to simply describe an army of brave individuals, let me suggest two other ways to use armor in your stories. The first is to use armor as a means of pacing the battle. The second way to use armor is to heighten the sense of suspense. These ideas go very well together, but let's have a look at them separately at first. Using armor to pace the battle. This is where the durability and the usefulness of armor clues the reader into the approaching climax of the fights. There are two good examples. The final battle in the first Eragon book, yes, I can say nice things about Christopher Paolini and his Eragon series, and the duel between Adolin and Relis in the words of Radiance. In the first battle in the Eragon book uh, that I'm mentioning right here, which is also called Eragon, Eragon, man, I keep saying that name so often, and his dragon Severa are both dressed in full armor. Together, they are like a tank on the battlefield around Trojaheim. However, as the battle wears on, both of them take a serious amount of damage to their armor. 
Aragon's chainmail and leather protects him from the worst of it, but his shield becomes unwieldy and the dents tear into his shoulder and arm. And when we look at Saphira, her armor becomes harder to maneuver in and she becomes weaker when she tries to fly because the armor cannot cover something like her wings. So she begins to lag as she loses blood and loses stamina. The armor suddenly becomes more of a hindrance than a help. But even worse, an Urgul comes in and gets a lucky shot on her center breastplate, caving it in and making it very painful to move. And so then when the enemy breaks underneath Trojaheim and enters into the city, Aragon and Saphira go to counterattack, but her armor, the dragon's armor, is so painful that it has to be removed. In order to stop the Urgles in time, Aragon must leave Saphira as she gets her armor taken off, which leaves him alone to face Durza and his compatriots. And Aragon's body and armor are in shambles. So you as the reader now know that this is the end of the battle and that it's going to be a quick and brutal duel. And it, that is communicated by the fact that Aragon is so haggard, which you wouldn't really have if he was just this epic hero cleaving his way through the battlefield with ease. My second example of this, using the armor to pace the battle, is brilliantly used when Adeline fights Relis and his cronies, in the words of Radiance, in a four-on-one duel. They are all wearing magical armor called Shardplate, which enhances the body and makes them nearly invincible. So long, though, as the armor holds. The armor can be broken through things like shard hammers or shard blades. So if the armor's weakened just enough, it begins to lose its power and its effectability begins to wear off and then it will become cumbersome to the wearer. So in this case, outnumbered four to one, Adelin has to plan his entire fight around how much damage his armor, his shard plate, can take. And as the reader, you keep track of his armor's damage from the beginning of the duel to the battle's very end, knowing the limits of his own armor and knowing that the drawbacks are going to be brutal if the armor loses power. And Adeline, as the character in this fight, also uses that information, and in fact, he's able to use it brilliantly to his own victory. It's seriously one of the best fights I have ever read. I've already done an analysis video of it. Please go check it out. These two examples are great for both showing how armor can be used to pace and time a fight, but they are also great examples of the strengths and weaknesses that armor brings to a battle. They protect you, but they can also become hindrances if the armor sustains too much damage. My second suggestion for using armor is to heighten the suspense. A great example of this is in the first Iron Man movie. While it uses the first suggestion that I gave as well, Let's have a look at this one. Utilizing Tony's power reserves is a way of timing the battle, but the movie helps to heighten the suspense by incorporating the strengths and weaknesses of the Iron Man suit and the Iron Monger suit as well. Tony getting Obadiah to fly so high up that his suit freezes is fantastic, but then he returns right as Tony's running out of power in his own suit. The drained power cells make you then think that Iron Man has lost, but his knowledge of how the suit works and their technology helps them to overall win, and the old arc reactor plays an important part in saving his life as well, right when you think that he is done for. This is a great battle because of the moments of suspense when you think that Obadiah might have won, then you think that Tony has won, and it switches back and forth. It creates a wonderful sense of suspense. Now, in terms of combining these two, creating the suspense and pacing the battle, I will briefly use an example from my own writing. I wrote a scene where there's a thief with a highly advanced suit of mechanical armor that he uses to try to rob a lich's tomb. His armor fully encases his body, enhances his senses, and increases his strength and dexterity. The tomb is placed in a freezing tundra and is filled with hundreds of zombies waiting to rush any intruder. The thief nearly makes it out, but a mistake gets him surrounded on all sides by the undead. The zombies themselves might not mean much to someone who is in this amazing mechanical armor, but hundreds of them dogpiling him is problematic. And then the liches get involved, and their magic can just tear his suit apart. 
His fight then is timed by the damage that his armor can take. He can only stay in the fight for as long as his armor is going to hold up, but he has to get away before he takes too much, and any break in his armor exposes him to corrupting scrapes and bites from the hordes of the undead, plus the freezing temperatures can assault his body through the breaks and slow him and the armor down. Each blow ticks the fight down to its conclusion, and each crack in the mechanical suit results in another danger that the thief has to compensate for. Thus, the suspense is heightened, and the battle is paced as you watch this armor slowly get worn down. Now, these are two ways that I would suggest that you think about armor in your fantasy stories. How can you use it to add suspense to your fights, and how can you utilize armor to pace the action and guide the reader to the end? Some parting advice that I will also give is this. If you want to have scenes where someone cuts through armor and bodies like they were nothing, save those moments to emphasize something. Something like just how dangerous this person is who's murdering all these people, or how dangerous their weapon is, or to emphasize the difference in ability between people, between the murderer and all these people who are just getting slaughtered. Or maybe you want to emphasize that this is a no-win situation because normally armor and weapons stand up pretty well to each other, and then this person comes in and just wrecks everyone. There's no way that we can win! Or sometimes you might even use one of these moments to provide a quick getaway for the heroes. Some way to save them in a moment where it's like, oh my gosh, how are they going to get out? These scenes can be amazing when done right. But if you use them too often, once again, you break the suspension of disbelief. So don't use them too often. Otherwise, you will lose the wow factor and cease to impress your audience. All right, that's going to do it for this rant. If you would like more writing advice, please drop by our podcast, Camille's Harem, found on Podbean, iTunes, and Google Play. We have writing exercises for you to check out over our Pinterest page and writing discussions over at our subreddit. We look forward to seeing you there, and until the next video, y'all, tschüss.